So today I thought we would have a look at the Chinese DB04R firing system. It's quite a cool little system. You have a 4Q firing module and a remote that changes. You can get like a 4 uh, button remote or this is a 12 button remote and you can get a 24 button remote which is actually a 12 button remote with a district changer down here. So you can go from 1 to 12 and then to district 2 goes from from uh, 13 to 24 etc and uh, these devices have an interesting write-up and life online some some people really rate them and say they're great for a starting system if you haven't got or you can't afford something like a cobra system or a pyroshore system etc others say that you shouldn't touch them because they're cheap and cheerful and they're potentially very dangerous etc some say that you can even set them off with your car key fob, which I don't honestly believe. But so, but, you know, that's what people believe. And they come, depending on how many you buy, they can also come in a little uh, green box like this one. And it makes some interesting claims. It claims it's a power light. Well, that's quite easy to find out. It's energy saving. I'm not quite sure why that's an issue with a firing system, but we'll have a look at that. Waterproof, that's quite good if it is waterproof because it's always raining in the UK so that'd be brilliant if it was a waterproof system and it's explosion proof which again is a little bit of an interesting claim because it just looks like a cheap plastic so how explosion proof that is I'm not really sure so basically uh, you turn it on and you get these four Q lights and a yellow light which is obviously the power light when you put a igniter in the queue the light gets brighter for that queue to show you got continuity or it stays dim to show that you don't have continuity uh, and you simply just press a button to fire it this interestingly is a module which does actually defaultly come as 9 to 12 but I've reprogrammed it to 1 to 4 but let's actually just go through the reprogramming system as we've got that ability on it so you get a, a paper clip and you just put it in that hole there and you wait for the yellow light to flash and then you select the queue you want to start from so 9 for this case so now it's now firing on 9, 10, 11 and 12 etc rather than 1, 2, 3, 4 so it's now back to how it was when it came uh, I tend to leave them all tied together so they're all I've got three of these modules all on 1 to 4 and I use them for fronts and that when my Cobra system is busy doing something else I'll run out of channels or something like that so let's actually have a look, see what, what's in here and see if we can figure out this is waterproof. Uh, let's leave the batteries in because that sounds far more fun, doesn't it? To take some of the part with the power supply still integrally part of it. I'm surprised actually when I uh, thought about doing this teardown that Big Clive hasn't done one. He tends to tear these sorts of things apart. And if you don't know about Big Clive's channel, I definitely join his channel and uh, watch watch his videos he takes all sorts of very interesting things apart a lot of them are the cheaper units and he goes through the design flaws and that they've got in them etc or why or why they're not so good and so forth so that's the, uh, the back off here we go now we've got our board can we can we zoom in a bit I'm sorry the lighting is a bit poor here let's see if we can try and focus that now my camera is complaining about the really poor lighting. So looking at this board, we can sort of see that I reckon these are probably MOSFETs down here, one for each firing channel, firing queue, and then what looks like a controller up there. Uh, some sort of memory possibly there, and the RF system there. We've got a bit of a dodgy bodge here. Try and get that chip in. If you look, they've sort of cut out half the circuit board to get that chip in there. Uh, this looks a bit dry down here, these these joints. Now in terms of waterproofing, there seems to be absolutely no waterproofing at all. There's no rubber seals. The board you'd expect to be potted in there, so they'd fill that whole top square up, effectively, that top rectangle up into a potting compound. Or another way of doing it is to what they call use conformal coating, which is when you put a lacquer across the board, and that's just a bare board. So they haven't done that, they haven't potted it, there's no rubber seals. So we can say straight away that this definitely is not waterproof, it's not even water resistant. So I'm a little bit upset that I've made that claim when there's clearly no effort has gone at all to making this waterproof. But anyway, let's, uh, let's go to a close up to the board and actually uh, see what's inside. 
OK, let's take a quick look at the PCB and just label the chipsets. First one at top left is a 14 pin package. All the identity marks have been removed. Somebody's sending them all off. However, it looks obvious to me in the layout that it's a microcontroller of some sort. Probably a cheap Chinese version, so it's not going to be a microchip one. It's going to be one of their sort of more uh, targeted markets in China. Next to that is an Atmel 702, which is a standard EEPROM. So that's going to contain, I think, our queue numbers. So it probably keeps track of the first queue number we're firing from. So in this case, uh, the default is a number 9 on this module. So that's going to just say 9 is my guess. And then that's going to be read into the microcontroller every time it turns on. And that will get rewritten when you program it to another channel. Next to that is a SIN480R which is an RF decoder chip and that sort of makes sense because if you look at all the passive components around there it's pretty much just resistors and capacitors and the aerial and there is also a crystal oscillator below that on the other side of the board which is tuned into 433 megahertz. The bottom four chipsets that all look the same are all the same surprisingly. They're 992618151 N-channel MOSFETs, that's a 20 volt MOSFET. They're all in dual packages so these have actually got two MOSFETs per chipset and they're wired together. So all the drains are tied together, all the sources are tied together, and all the gates are tied together for each Q number. So they're obviously firing both, uh, both channels together, both MOSFETs together. Let's start by having a look at the firing circuit. It's a little bit difficult to draw that makes it look good, but hopefully I've managed to make it look fairly simple. Uh, those of you that may not be fully aware of electronics MOSFETs, they're basically switches in this case. So when you put a voltage at the gate, which is the, 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 the leg coming off the centre of them, then the uh, it connects top and bottom basically. So the top connection is called the drain and the bottom section is called the source. So when you apply a voltage at the gate, the drain and the source connect together and allow the current to flow, which is exactly what we want in this case. When we enable the MOSFET, we want a current to flow. So the very basics is when the unit turns on, we have a dim LED. This is because uh, current goes through a 20k resistor, then through the red LED, then through a 1k resistor to ground. And it won't go to ground through the MOSFETs because the MOSFETs will start disabled, obviously. They won't be enabled until you fire a cube. When you put an igniter in line, obviously the LED gets brighter. And this is because, obviously, an igniter compared to 20k is only about 1 or 2R, so it's, it's insignificant in terms of resistance. So most current will want to flow through the igniter and then down for the LED and then the 1k becomes our current limiting resistor so next to nothing if anything will go for the 20k resistor so that's why our LED gets brighter because of that that lower resistance source from the igniter if we then fire the cue the LED goes out this is simply because when you fire the cue the MOSFETs ground the voltage out basically and the current instead of going through the 1k resistor and the LED which is resistive obviously it will go straight for the MOSFETs because there's no resistance there well there's next to no resistance there it's, it's tiny so the, all the current want to go through the MOSFETs and they won't go through the strand of the LED and the 1k similarly when you fire the Q if you have an igniter in obviously the current will go straight through the 1R or 2R igniter resistance bridge wire straight through the MOSFETs they will not want the the current will not travel through the LED or the 1K resistor because that's far higher resistance than going straight to the MOSFETs. Current will always go for the least resistive route. So in this case, that's straight through the, our ignited wire, our bridge wire, through the MOSFET straight to ground. So that's why the LED gets goes off because of that sudden surge in current through the MOSFETs. So that explains why the LED gets starts off dim and gets brighter. But it also shows us that if we remove the 20k, we could actually make it so the LED starts off. And then we put our igniter in, it comes on to show continuity, how most systems would do it. That seems a logical way of doing it. So for me, it seems weird that the Chinese have added a 20k resistor, which is only expensive. You've got to add another resistor to the, to the module in every manufacturing unit. So why do that? And actually, it makes sense to put the 20k there and have the LED on from the start because... Let's say, and this is very, very unlikely, one of these MOSFETs fails, but it fails closed, so that it is always conducting. That would mean 
that as soon as you put anything into the queue terminals and turn the module on, it would fire immediately. So by having that 20k there, it means when you turn the module on, the LED won't be lit. So it's showing you that that queue has an issue because obviously the MOSFET is stuck on. So it's warning you there that, you know, this is a problem. Don't use this queue. So if you're going to use this in the field, I would actually say that maybe you should uh, turn the module on without the queues in it first and make sure the ADs come on. Then you can wire it up to it because then you know all the queues should work. Obviously, there's a chance the LED could fail, so it's not a MOSFET problem. It could just be the LED. But even, you know, this is very unlikely. Most MOSFETs will fail clo uh, open circuit anyway. So the likelihood of, it, if, of actually um, failing open, uh, closed is, is very, very unlikely. But maybe that is why they've put the 20K there, just to make sure that if it does in that really, really random event happens that the MOSFET fails closed, the user can see that that queue has an issue. So that's a safety feature, I believe. That's the only reason I can see why that, that would be there, why they'd leave that 20K there and have it lit constantly. That 20K resistor is certainly not there to be efficient because obviously it's keeping these LEDs on, which is highly inefficient for a battery device. Now, if we actually look at the MOSFETs in a bit more detail, we can see that the gates of the MOSFETs are tied together because they fire together from the same microcontroller pin. But we have a 20k resistor tying them to ground. This is bias in the gate of, the, of the, the MOSFET. And that's crucial because microcontrollers do not boot able. So there'll be a boot up sequence in the microcontroller where the inputs and outputs may do anything they want to do. You've got no idea what state it's going to start up in. And equally, you've got no idea what state it's going to shut down in because as power just slowly drains from it, it could do anything. So by biasing the gates from that through that 20k resistor, you are stopping them from enabling basically from any stray sort of half voltage that may end up on that line or any floating voltage that may end up on that line by accident so that's a good design feature to have that 20k there pulling the mosfet gates down to ground so that sort of keeps them off until you send them the pulse to enable them to come on so that's a nice bit of design. And I say I like this idea of having the 20k resistor there for the LED. So you know if the MOSFETs have failed closed, you can see that when you turn the module on. That's a neat bit of, of uh, design that I hadn't considered at all when I started looking at this unit. If we now look at the logic circuit, so this is actually the intelligent side of the device, where you can see it has very little in it, as we're expecting. Starting from right to left, we have the RF decoder. Now I've only included pin 5, which is the data output, it's a serial data output of the decoder which connects to our microcontroller. I have left out all the other pins because the circuitry of the decoder is more likely to be an exact copy of what's in the data sheet. It's not going to be something that they've probably designed themselves, it's going to be an off-the-shelf solution, so it's of no interest to me really to look at that side of things, it's, it's going to be in the data sheet. Moving on to the power LED, the yellow LED, we can see that's just basically an output from the microcontroller. So that's not like a direct power LED, which would be going across the, the power rails to show when the power is on and off. This is an intelligent power light, so this is going to be used for other things, like it does get used for other things. It also gets used for when you program, it flashes when you in program mode, and it also goes out, I think, when you press a button on the, on the transceiver. So it obviously... Uh, when it receives data goes out to show that it's received data as well. Moving left we have the program switch which is normally closed so this is obviously working by the fact that when you press the switch the input goes low rather than goes high it's up to the designer which way they'd like to do it they've obviously decided to do it that way that's fine however for me I don't like the idea that from the switch to the microcontroller there is no pull down resistor on there it's good design practice to put a physical resistor there to pull the input to low when you take the switch out. Otherwise, the input will, 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 will just float. And that's bad. That causes all sorts of erratic problems in microcontrollers. You don't want to float the input. So what I think they've done is they've used an internal pull down on that input to effectively make sure the chipset pulls itself down to the rail. Because most chipsets, most microcontrollers will have a pull up and a pull down resistor which you can activate within the firmware if you want to use it. However, for a critical control system, I wouldn't like to rely on the firmware to do that itself in case you forget to set it or there's some corruption. It's just far better to put a physical resistor there so you know that that input will never float. 
but that's obviously a design cost thing they've decided to do without. Maybe they think that that's fine, and it usually is in most applications. Going, carrying on going left, we have the SCL and SDA lines that go down to the East I squared C prom. So SCL and SDA are I squared C protocol lines. This is the data bus and the clock bus, effectively. And this is a little bit dodgy again, personally. This is outside. If you're looking at this from a designer's point of view, this is against the specification. You would know that um, I squared C is based not on my, like most protocols where the um, effectively the driving controller would send the bus high to start a communication. I squared C is about driving the bus low to communicate. Uh, it's what's often referred to as an open drain uh, protocol. Therefore, the bus has to be held high for it to be driven low. And there's no resistors pulling these, these lines high, which you should have. Uh, usually it's a low resistance, so somewhere between 2K2 and 4K7, if my memory is correct. I can't remember about looking at the specification. So this wouldn't work, is the answer, if this was like it is. However, I think they have again utilised the internal pull-up resistors on the microcontroller to hold the SCL and SDA line high. This is not really very good design work because the internal as a microcontroller normally the internal resistors will be in the matter of like 20 to 60k quite high which is far higher than the recommendation or within specification of pulling the data lines and clock lines high for I squared C. So I would really not recommend doing that. But it obviously works and it probably works because they only have one chip on the line. They've obviously tested that and found, oh, it works good enough, we'll just keep it as it is and just save the cost of the resistors. But if there was more chips in there, if there was, you know, most applications you'll find if I squared C is such a universal protocol, you may have 10 to 12 devices on one line all talking to each other. So you would not be able to get away with, with the way they've done it here. But again, as you say, there's always a cost aspect to this. So they've obviously worked, found that it works and they've gone there, that's good enough. Let's take resistors out. And actually, that's not an unheard of thing. Sometimes when product design, uh, you will get people that go around taking away passive components until it stops working. And then they'll put those ones that go that stopped it from working back in again and go, well, look, this product works with half of these components gone. So we're not going to put them into manufacture. We're going to bear the brunt of if it goes wrong in the field, we're just going to get rid of the, the components. And that's particularly quite common when it gets to decoupling capacitors and that, which we'll talk to in a second. Uh, so... Yeah, and that goes to an I squared C problem, which we really discussed. So that's their external memory. It doesn't contain uh, the actual program for the microcontroller. That just contains the uh, the identification of the first queue that fires and the remote control. And I'll look at that in a second. We'll look more into the I squared C line. We'll actually probe that and see what communications we get from that. And we'll also probe the RF decoder as well and see what communications we get from that. So top left now is we have an interesting arrangement of some capacitors and a resistor. And at first thoughts, you look at that and you see the 56R resistor and you think, well, hang on a minute, that must be very inefficient to power the chipset effectively from a 56 ohm resistor. Uh, also, the RF decoder, I believe, is, is tapped from there as well, but I haven't actually put it in just to try and make it a bit simpler to look at. Um, and the reason why that is because the resistor is not there because of the, the other chipsets. It's there because of the capacitor sitting next to it. So these capacitors have various jobs in the world of electronics. Usually people would say, oh, they're decoupling capacitors, which means that they stop coupling, which is the effect of other subsystems in a circuit affecting another subsystem. So for example, if you had a fast oscillator somewhere in your circuit, that will often put noise onto the power rails. And the reason for that there's a very sort of simplistic view is because if you've got something that's going from low to high very quickly, then to drive something high takes a current to be drawn. So it's putting the current from the power rail and then it's going low, which is stopping that current being drawn from the power rail and then it's going back high again. So it's pulling more current and that constant movement of current will show us a dip in voltage. So if you have an oscillator, you'll often find that on the power rails, you'll get the same frequency noise on the power rails from that chipset. So you then for you put capacitors across that to act like temporary storage to maintain the power supply to smooth out those sudden dips you get in voltage. And normally decoupling capacitors will be done as close as possible to the power chips, the, the positive and the ground on the chipsets themselves, 
Whereas these capacitors are sitting way to one side of the board. These are nowhere physically near the power rails of the chipsets. So I think these are actually more there to support the power rail when you have a large current being drawn, which would be when it fires. So maybe they found that when they fire it, the, the, the current that's drawn from the power supply is so high, the voltage drops so much, it actually depowers all the chipsets, which is a very bad thing to do because you then have to end up resetting the device. So what would happen is you'd send the fire current, the fire current would sort of pulse down, and as soon as it went so far that the voltage dropped to the point that the controller reset, Obviously, it stopped firing, so you'd end up with this very quick firing pulse, and then the system would reset, and then it would act as if nothing happened, because obviously the voltage would recover in the power supply as soon as that current stopped being drawn. So maybe it would never fire, is the answer to that, if, if you didn't have that reserve capacitance there to maintain the voltage on the chipsets. So what is the resistor for, is the next question. Well, that's there not to be inefficient, which is what it is effectively, because you've moved in the series of the power connections to the chipsets, it's there actually to uh, bleed the charge from the capacitors when the power turns off. So what would happen is if you just turn the 6 volt power off, these capacitors would maintain their charge, sort of. It would drop out eventually because you know no, nothing is, is that efficient. You would find that there will be internal resistances in the, capa in the capacitors themselves. And there'd also be resistances on the traces and the chipsets and so forth, and they would eventually bleed themselves from from out of charge. But the problem is with that is you end up with the capacitors creating their own power source effectively once you've disabled the main power source, and that's not good design. You want something that you want to know that you don't have charged capacitors sitting in your device once you've turned it off. So that resistor there is to bleed the charge out of the capacitor sitting next to it once the device turns off and we can actually if we probe that very quickly there we go you can see from that trace that the the actual capacitors drain fairly quickly once the uh, power's turned off we can see that that's 500 milliseconds per division so you know within two seconds three seconds the voltage sorry has dropped significantly so that's probably a fairly okay discharge. That's far quicker than it would be if you didn't have that resistor there. So yeah, they've thought about that. That's a nice thing to think about. I'm pleased they've done that. Let's also actually have a look at what happens when you do fire it. So if we look at the firing, uh, the, sorry, the voltage rails when we fire, this is what we get as a trace. So you can actually see here the capacitors working. You can see on that that first edge, that first, you can see how it it drops and then sort of curves out that's obviously the discharge of the capacitors in there and then as you, similarly the other side of that where it charges back up again the voltage goes back up again you can see the capacitors charging so you've got that curved edge charging back up to the voltage rail so you can see them in action on there so what are we looking at here so this is the so when i press a, this is me probing the voltage the positive power supply after the resistor so we're looking past the capacitors so this is what the chipsets are seeing on the voltage rail and I've pressed fire on the remote and I've got an igniter in there and you can see that you've suddenly got a huge draw in current which is the reason why the voltage drops off but it only drops effectively as one volt per, dish, per, per division so it's only about a volt it drops which is quite good actually I would suspect it'd be far higher than that but anyway so you've got this huge draw of current and you can see that the igniter pops that's why the pulse is so short that that's not the entire fire pulse the fire impulse, as we discussed, is about one and a half seconds, whereas this is only, what, over, just over 300 milliseconds, something like that. So this is because you've got the huge draw of current, the igniter's popped, gone, gone open circuit, so the voltage has recovered because the current has stopped being drawn. If the igniter did not pop open and it stayed closed, then you'd see a much longer one and a half seconds dip because obviously... The, the current would still be being drawn through the short circuit. So in this case, it's interesting that the igniter has popped open because it's, it's quite common to pop closed. But So that sort of highlights what happens to the power rail when you draw a huge current from it to get that voltage drop. So that sort of concludes our quick look at the intelligence side of things. 
Let's now look at the memory and see what I squared C is doing and see what we can learn from that maybe. So what we're going to look at now is the I squared C line from the microcontroller to the EEPROM. Now it's a little bit difficult to figure out when it's going to talk. We've got no way of knowing, but usually when you program these things, there's some common times when you'd expect to talk. The first time is during startup because you want to load in to the microcontroller into variables what, for example, the Q number is. So for me, logically, I would say that at startup, there is going to be a communication on the I squared C line. Here I have a piece of software called PulseView, which is connected to my very cheap and cheerful logic analyzer. If you want to know about logic analyzers, I've got a video about it, which I'll link in below. You can see separately. Uh, I have, first of all, started naming off my channels. So I've got SDA and SCL as my I squared C line. This is just good housekeeping. I've also added a trigger ratio of 10%, a pre-trigger ratio, just so we catch the beginning of the communication in case we miss some of it. Uh, I've got a really fast sample rate, so we're going to make sure we get the whole message. So now if I uh, run Pulse View and start the module, there we go. We've captured some data, excellent. And if we have a little look, we have uh, if you look down here, I've got decoders running at the bottom of my uh, waveforms, which just helps me figure out what we're doing. It's a very useful part of PulseView. And we can see we've got a sequential random read, which is addressed from zero and it's five bytes. So what basically that means is that the microcontroller tells it where to start, which in which case it's saying address zero, zero. Then the EEPROM will read back the byte that's in that memory address. The microcontroller will then respond with an acknowledge command if it wants another byte, and then it will read the next byte to the EEPROM will read the next byte to the microcontroller. If the microcontroller wants another byte, it will then say again, let's acknowledge that and get another byte, etc. And this has got five bytes. So we've read five bytes of memory from 00 to 05, and we've got 092ECC09A9 as data. Doesn't mean an awful lot. At the moment, however, interestingly, 09 is the Q number we're starting from. We're starting from 9 on this module, so could that possibly be the starting address, the starting Q number? Now, also, we've got to think about is that we want to make sure our controller is the only controller that fires this module. We don't want any old random controller firing this module. So maybe the 2ECC09A9 could be the unique identifier of the remote, maybe. So we're reading the Q number to start with and the remote ID so we can match it when we start to use the device, maybe. That's my current theory. Let's look at another point of time we may get some data. Let's re-trigger this. So another common time could be when we actually press a button on the remote. So let's do that. Let's press uh, number nine on the remote. Oh, look at that. We've got some more data. So let's see what that's doing. That's another random read. But this time it's only going to have memory address 2 for 3 bytes, CC09A9. So could that be the address of the ID of the remote control? Maybe that's the unique identifier. Maybe CC09A9 is the identifier of the remote. Uh, but why is it reading that again? It should have that from the previous startup. That you'd think the microcontroller would just keep that in memory. Why does it need to... So it might just put it into a variable in, in memory, local memory. Why does it need to recall that again? Not sure. Let's now also just, uh, let's first of all, if we start, let's re-trigger PulseView. Let's now put this into program mode and change what address we start from. So I've now enabled, come on, I've now enabled that to be reprogrammed. I'll put in number one this time. Ah, oh, that's interesting. We've got four bits of data that looks at on the I squared C line after we've programmed it. So the first one is a page write. Well, that's what we're expecting. We're expecting it to write to memory with the new stuff, the new the new Q number. And we've got from address five, three bytes. From address five, that's interesting. We haven't actually read from address five yet. We addressed, we read from zero to five, was it? But now we're actually 
writing from address 5. Again, CC09A1, that's changed from A9, A9, wasn't it, to A1. So could that be last four bits be the Q number of that byte? So maybe CC09A is the unique identifier. Let's see what else we've written. So we've also got two bytes at the beginning from address 00, 012E, 01. So that was 09. So again, it looks like we've, we've changed that to the first Q number that we're firing. 2E, that's interesting, 2E's there because that's not part of the first program. So I'm not quite sure what 2E is relating to. Let's have a little look at the next lot. Another page right from 0 to memory address 3 byte CC09A1. So we're rewriting CC09A1 again for some reason. And last bit of data is rewriting 012E at the beginning from address 00. That's really intriguing. Why is it rewriting? You could do all that in one write because we've addressed from what was that? We've addressed, we've written from 00 to 07 in terms of address memory. So why have we done that? Why have they done that? There's loads of individual write commands. You could do that as one long. If you just kept saving the data of a variable, you could then just dump it straight onto the I squared C line and just save all at once. And why are we reading, why are we writing, sorry, from 05 to 07? Because we didn't read that, did we? We read from 00 to 04. We read from 07 five bytes, wasn't it? So that would have read from address 00 to 04. So we haven't actually read from 05, 06, 07 when we turn the device on. So why is it writing to it? It doesn't seem to actually read that. Intriguing. So to try and make sense of it a bit more, I've just tore down the wireless remote and had a look inside. There's not much in there. All there is is a chipset called an EV1527, which is an OTP encoder. So I did a quick search online to find the data sheet for that. And we're beginning to find some interesting answers that tells me that it has a unique address which is 20 bits long and then it transmits four data bits so we know now that we're looking for 20 bits as a unique identifier and then four bits for data if we have a now look at the receiving so i've changed my uh, logic analyzer to the output of this to the receiver chipset on the module and when I record the data this is what I get in pulse view so you can see we have uh, I've clicked one two three four on the control so you can see we have four segments of data so where I'm going from is effectively uh, it's like that bit there is one communication as far as I can see, and then that's repeated. So that's another communication there, another communication there, another communication there. All this high and low randomly in the middle, this is all just noise. So that's nothing to, of any interest to us. So let's have a quick look at the data here. And I've got a PWM encoder, uh, so decoder put on here so we can see what things like our period and duty cycle. So we can see the period of all these pulses is the same, which is very interesting. But the duty cycle is different. But the duty cycle only seems to change between two values, which would be our uh, one and zero values. At a guess, I would say that the longer duty cycle will be a one and the shorter duty cycle will be a zero. So if we now work that out, we have a one, one zero zero one one zero 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 one zero zero one one zero one zero 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 one if we compare that to hex that would be cc 9 a one surprisingly and of course those last four bits that make the one are the data bits so if we count from uh, the first seven, seven duty cycles, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and then one, two, three, four bits, four data bits. So that's why we're getting A1 and A9. So that will be from A1 to AC technically. That will give you from one to 12 on the remote. So that makes sense. We now know we have 20 bits unique identifier. 
So now we can see what the CC09A is. That is the identifier of the remote, the unique identifier of the remote. So that's why it's recording that at the memory. We know why the 7 is there, or the 1's there, or the 9's there. That's the Q starting, or the switch technically you're pressing on the controller. So if I, for example, that was a 1 on that control, if we, on that pulse, if I go over to this data here and look at the last four bits, we've got 0010, which would be 2. So that makes sense. If you look at the next uh, data, we've got 0011, which would be 3. So that's the third button. So we can actually begin to see this makes sense. Why is it sending so many uh, groups that I'm getting that's to do with redundancy of making sure that the receiver gets it. You normally send packets of, of groups so that you hope that at least one of them will be received and decoded correctly. So that, that sort of makes sense why you've got so many sort of bits, groups and packets of information there for each uh, send. So we're getting there. But what we haven't, we haven't figured out yet is what 2E is. I've got maybe 2E, because this can be programmed by more than one remote, so maybe 2E tells the module what type of remote we're on. Because if you look at the other, if the, so these supposedly you can have up to 300 of these 4Q channels, modules, on one remote. But the remote has what they call districts. So you have district 1, which gives you Qs 1 to 12, district 2, that gives you Qs 1 to 12, district 3, etc. And so you've used all, uh, all your Qs up, so 1,200 Qs, something like that. So maybe the two E's there is telling it sort of what remote it's on. So to look for what bit pattern we need to look for maybe and how many data bits maybe. I've, I have no idea is the answer what two E's for. But we can say we've come to confidence now that the first address 00, zero contains the Q number that the module is starting from. Zero 02 address we don't know, that's the two E's. I've got no idea what that is. And then Q's of course, uh, sorry, the uh, data in 02 is CC, 0309, 04A1. So we know that is the remote control, including the data bits. So we also know that 050607 that also records CC09, 0, or A1, or A7, or A9, or whatever it's going to be, is also the remote control, our unique identifier plus data. So we've worked that much out now from both listening to the RF in decoder and listen to the I squared C bus. So it's sort of coming together now. We'll begin to understand what's happening. So I'm going to leave that tear down there. This has ended up being a far longer video than I was expecting. I'm currently, before I finish the edit, I'm currently at 40 minutes. So per, this is going to be a long watch. So I can't do much more than this, but I'll leave you with the memory allocation addresses. So you can see what we looked at during the video. I, I still can't see a reason for 2E. It'd be interesting to get different remote control for it and see if it changes like one of the bigger ones that has more districts to see if that 2E changes and how it changes the memory address allocations. This this obviously interprets the controller to some extent. So going back to what we previously said about using key fobs, some of your car to set it off, I really can't see that's ever going to happen. I don't think that would, you know, that's such a remote possibility. It, it, it seems rather absurd to me in some ways. Also, if you think about it, you're not going to have your car sitting next to the firing site. So your key fob would have to be pretty powerful to reach the receiver anyway, if you're in a car park and you're firing, you know, the other side of a site. So I don't know, it's, it seems a little bit far-fetched still, you know, but saying that, you know, you look at how this, the system here is wired, you know, without putting the aerials out, I've managed to go way over a hundred meters signal strength so it's got a long range to it just following back to begin as our energy saving it mentioned about that i haven't really found any evidence of that either there's no sleep mode so some modules for example like cobra when you leave them on for a certain amount of time they go into low power mode they go into sleep mode i haven't noticed that on these modules i haven't actually checked them uh scope wise to see if they do sort of their power does their current does lower I've had them on for a fairly long time, you know, I've had these on for half an hour, an hour before now, and the LEDs and that still stay lit up on the modules and they haven't gone to sleep type thing. So I don't think there is a power saving mode on them. So that's another one of those little beginning parts on the on the box that we can get rid of. I don't think they're explosion proof, but there is a power light. So 
it's a little bit sad that they've added things to it because the product itself actually I think stands quite well. It's not you know sort of like the mo the safest product you know what i mean you could add extra safety to it you could put mosfets on the high side and the low side you could put circuitry that tests the mosfets before it turns on to make sure there's no faults and it doesn't accidentally fire when you turn it on uh, you could you know just you could, you could generally do a few things a little bit neater in some ways if you, if you wanted to increase the safety aspect of it you could do a little bit more logic hardware logic in there but that might be a little bit unnecessary. So yeah, I don't know. There's, there's things you could do. You could you could also change actually the continuity checking system. You could maybe check the resistance rather than just have an LED that comes on if there's something in the Q channel because you don't have to short. It could be a short circuit. You could have accidentally put the two igniter cables together, or you could let it twist in. So this doesn't show you that that's a short. It just, it'll still also show you continuity. So you could do like a resistance reading and you would know if it's a short or whether, whether the actual igniter is good or not. That would be another interesting thing to do. You could also add a current limiting device on the queues. So if you had a dead short on one queue and you fired another queue, it wouldn't then fail to fire the next queue because the first queue is taken with the current. But saying that on these modules, actually, they do not fire more than one queue simultaneously. If you press Q1 and then Q2, Q1 will actually cut short. So it won't fire for the whole one and a half seconds. It will cut to, I don't know, to how long it takes you to press number two. So in a way, that would never be an issue anyway on these modules. But again, we're going a bit beyond the price point of this module. This is supposed to be a cheap and cheerful way of getting into electronic firing. And I think it's fairly safe. There's nothing in the electronics that scares me. I'm quite happy to carry on using this. But obviously, it's down to the individual user whether they think that it's, it's a good system or not. But it's certainly not horrendously unsafe like some people seem to think online well my personal opinion is it doesn't seem to be horrendously unsafe but you know it always depends on what your baseline is if your baseline is that you want to have a system like cobra that has uh, a self-checking system to make sure there's no dangerous shorts in the system before it turns on and before it enables the cues then you know that's something that you may decide well this doesn't have that this could potentially fire when I turn it on if there is a short although I did say that you know that LED business might be an interesting way that if you turn it on empty and all the LEDs are on you've probably got a good chance of it not being malfunctioning so you know there's it's it, it also sort of partly goes down to best practice doesn't it that you shouldn't be standing over a firework when you turn the system on so you know it, it's it's all about how you you choose safety and how you do a risk assessment on it basically but there's nothing inherently dangerous I don't think in this design I'd be more than happy to carry on using these modules after tearing it down there's, but I'll leave it up to you thanks for watching I hope that's been of some use to you it's a blue and long video I can tell you that but hopefully you've learned something I've learned a lot from it it's been really interesting tearing this down I'd really like to start looking at other stuff and tearing some other stuff down and seeing how other people do things but maybe another day